Jeff Tritton, thank you so much for joining us on the Plant Trainers Podcast today. Thank you. Nice to see you guys. Good to see you too. And yeah, we can see you. It's been a long time that we didn't have a video on these podcasts and now we do. So welcome to everybody who can see us too. Do you have a moment of gratitude you want to share with us and the listeners? Um, absolutely. Um, I think one of the coolest things about being here in Southeast Michigan is PBNSG, if you can see it on the shirt. Um, we've got a fantastic plant-based community here that is very supportive. And, uh, if you don't have a community of some type, get involved, whatever it might be, uh, because I, I tell you, they, um, they've become my closest friends and my greatest, uh, allies and supporters. And, um, I, the last two years have been invaluable, uh, especially with them in it. So very thankful for them. So I love the shirt. I think I need to get one. We were actually going to ask you uh, to talk about it a little bit. Since you did, can you give us the website or where you think people need to go to connect with PBNSNG? So um, if the, if you're in Michigan, we even have a group in Toledo and one in Windsor, Canada, and we're, and we're slowly kind of expanding. Uh, we have a lot of small groups throughout the state. I think we're at about 37 or so. Um, where people meet usually in public places, a community center and that type of thing where we do uh, whole food plant based oil free potlucks. Um, you know, there's we we have a lot of ideas that we bring to our small group hosts uh, that they can that they can share, whether it's um, cooking without oil or how to best dock a plant based pantry or the latest in uh, nutrition science and that type of thing. So um pbnsg.org is the website so that's that's one spot and certainly there's other groups around um i some people that are a little bit more remote have i've seen have luck on meetup.com and of course uh plant peer pods have uh, pods all over the place as well very cool so we'll put links to those in the show notes at planttrainers.com so people can connect with that great group and uh, meet some other amazing plant-based people and get healthier all together. Uh, We're here with you today, Jeff, because we came across your amazing story and we thought it was really inspirational and very important for our listeners to hear about because I'm sure in some way somebody listening will be impacted. So why don't you tell us a little bit about your story, about being that barbecue chef to being the chef you are now and living the lifestyle you're living now? Um, well, you know, it was an interesting transition. I, um, I spent a lot of years in the restaurant industry. And then uh, from about 2011 through 2017, beginning of 2017, I had a barbecue restaurant in southeast Michigan. And over the course of that time, I gained uh, about 20 to 25 pounds per year uh, and got to a whopping 348 pounds. Um, So, you know, as weight gain happens, um, you know, sometimes people get some other um, some other uh, metabolic issues like type 2 diabetes and blood pressure and, you know, things like that. Um, so I was struggling with kind of a whole host of things, but the thing that was really persistent was, uh, in 2015, I, I developed real severe edema. So I had swelling in my extremities and particularly it, it was in my right leg. Um, my ankle and foot would swell up, um, just horribly. And it was pretty painful as well. And over the course of about a year and a half, I went to, Uh, A couple of urgent cares, my primary care doctor, um, I had one urgent care do an EKG and said, oh, I see something I don't like. I'm going to, you know, have you check into uh, University of Michigan Hospital, Uh, sent me to the ER there. Uh, They didn't really find anything. Um, And then, you know, I just got to a point where I'd had enough. I checked myself into a hospital. That was October uh, 2nd of 2017, I guess it was. Gosh. My dates are, are off 16, rather. Um, so I checked myself into a hospital and uh, stayed overnight. They ran a lot of tests. Um, they just didn't address anything, and they just wanted to give me more pills. So, you know, I talked to my, my mom about it, and I said, you know, I'm not really sure 
what to do here. They're not giving me any answers. Um, you know, I'm still having gastrointestinal issues. I still have this severe swelling going on. Um, you know, I had real bad sleep apnea. I wasn't hardly sleeping. So when I was, you know, at my at my business, I'd take a break and I'd sit down and I'd be falling asleep. I mean, I couldn't spend two minutes at the computer before I was nodding off. I was so exhausted. Um, but we did work it like 90 hours a week, so it was a little crazy. Uh, we had a we had a pretty booming business. But um, my mom said to me, "Don't fill those prescriptions." She says, "Food is medicine. Do the damn research." Mm-hmm. I said, all right. Well, you know, I can't really go into work. So my partner was managing things at the shop and I, uh, I did. And I, and I embarked on a, on an anti-inflammatory diet. So I cut my dairy consumption down to next to nothing. And I stopped eating beef, chicken and pork. And in three weeks, lo and behold, that edema was gone. Hmm. And in a hundred days, my blood pressure normalized my sleep apnea went away, my blood sugar normalized, and I lost 80 pounds in 100 days. It was crazy. So, you know, I was like, wow, there's something to this. I'm going to keep researching. Um, I watched Forks Over Knives in February of 2017, and uh, that was like real eye-opening. And at that point, I stopped eating dairy altogether. Um, I continued to do some research. I came across an, uh, believe it or not, a, not a nutritionfacts.org video, but an old lecture that Dr. Greger did. Um, and I, I, and I can't even remember the gist of it, but it was when he was younger, he still had hair. He was, you know, wearing something that was, um, reminiscent of the, of the seventies or early eighties, kind of a dark brown, um, type type thing and he was lecturing at a at a university and they had videoed it it was probably early 90s is my guess um and that's when i decided that i needed to you know really take a look at my protein sources because i followed that protein power diet for years low carb in it and uh you know i and it was just ingrained in my head that I had to have high protein, high protein, high protein. And if I wanted to lose weight over the years, besides my barbecue stint, I'd just go on a low carb diet and drop 20 or 30 pounds, gain it all back and then some, but, um, you know, there was certainly a yo-yo effect, but I didn't know that, that that was a possible way to lose some weight, uh, despite the, the detriments to the rest of our health. But, um, I, I, I guess, you know, I, I decided that I was getting enough protein in my diet that all the plants had protein. And, and I think that was the hardest thing mentally to overcome. And I think that is for a lot of people. And, you know, it, as I just continued on my journey, the weight just dropped and dropped and dropped and dropped. And over 20 months, it was a total of 168 pounds. Um, I'm in the gym frequently now, um, something that I enjoy. I love to bike. Um, you know, I don't kill myself and, and a lot of people ask me if, if the weight loss was as a result of the gym and no, the first, the first, uh, over a year I wasn't in the gym even a little bit. Um, you know, for the first probably 13 or 14 months, I just, it was diet and I, and I walked, took a 20 minute walk here and there. And that was really about it. And, you know, they say we only need about 150 minutes of moderate exercise per week. And so I was doing roughly about that. And, um, you know, that's about it. I mean, it was, it was surprisingly easy. Um, you know, I had struggled in the past trying to drop a few pounds here and there, and this just kind of melted away. And it was just like, wow, I guess that's how my body's intended to uh, be fueled. So that, that was, that's been kind of the gist of my journey in the beginning. Um, and then, you know, I'm not sure what questions you have at this point. So I wanted to know when you went to your mom to ask her what to do, is that because she is your mom or is she a professional of some kind that you had more trust in her? Um, well, because she's my mom for sure. Um, but also, you know, she, she was very healthy, um, almost 70 years old, still working practically full time, um, manages her house beautifully and her massive lawn and gardens and all that type of thing. She's very active, very healthy. And, uh, she w- I would say that she was on a pescatarian diet. So eat some fish. Um, but she also stopped eating dairy 
uh, at the same time that I did. It was her and I watched that Forks Over Knives together. And she made the decision as well to take that out of her diet. And uh, that helped her out a lot, too. She was having some, um, some small intestine blockage, some inflammation that would happen, uh, which was a result of a surgery, basically. And, um, yeah, pretty much after she quit the dairy, that, that mostly went away. So, Those first 100 days, those just a little more than three months that you stopped eating the meat... How did you feel throughout that process? Was that challenging for you if you were still working as a barbecue chef? What was that so, like? So um, the answer to that is uh, I think the answer is no. You know, it's I don't miss meat. There's nothing about it that I miss. Um, I you'd think that it would be hard and, you know, and I ate a lot of barbecue in my life. Right. But, um, it, it, I think the, I think the cool thing for me personally is that I do love to cook. And so it was an opportunity to try a lot of new recipes and to experiment with things. So in that regard, I'd say that it wasn't difficult uh, to do. But as far as, um, I think when people see results, like I saw, Immediately, I think psychologically that says I'm staying in the game. Uh, and the people that just sort of dabble their toes in it and it's not helping and that type of thing, it seems like they fall off pretty quickly. But when you go all in and you see those type of results, I mean, gosh, in, in a couple of months I was off of my CPAP machine and I sold the stinking thing. I knew I was never going to need it again. Um, you know, And to, to have all of those health conditions just melt away, uh, was absolutely mind blowing, and to have the weight just drop off like that. I mean, I had really struggled for a lot of years with weight, so um, you know, it was mind altering for sure. So there's a couple of reasons I asked that, and one is because a lot of people that we speak to, they yeah, they're going to dabble in it. They're not a hundred percent in. They're not sure if it's the right thing to do. There's so much confusion when it comes to nutrition. There is well, like. You made a decision because your mom told you to. Not everybody has a mom that's going to tell them well, to do that. It, it sounds she, like she, she told me. Yeah, she told me to do the research. Yeah. Right, that's true. And that there's so much power in that because so many of us, including us, have been so guilty of barfing information on people. And when right. you say to somebody, "The information's there. Go look at it." Before you decide what to do, go look at it, go find out for yourself, and you're transferring that power from you, and you have no power over somebody, right. you're transferring that power from you and giving it to them, there's so much more that people can do with that, and I thought that that was really great, what your mom did, like what a great yeah. learning opportunity for all of us in this movement, but also as parents in general. Hmm. Right. Yeah, it was it was um, certainly I'm a do it myself kind of person anyways. And I think my mom knows that. But, you know, her admonition to me was don't fill the prescriptions. You don't you don't need to be taking more prescriptions. Um, and she's not a doctor, you know, but she's like food is medicine. You'll you'll find it. You got to look. So yeah. I did. Yeah, that's really amazing. I just find that people are very hesitant to do anything about their lifestyle until they're already in a position where it's too late. And then yeah. they say, okay, now what do I do? When the answer was in front of us all the time, the answer's on our plate all the time. We just need to make that choice. But it's very hard to get people to make that choice if they're not ready to make the change. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And I and it is sad to me as well that people, you know, have to have something drastic happen in their in their life in order for them to make a change. That was the case for me as well. But we're also sort of a pill-driven, uh, convenience-driven society as well. And as a result, you know, it's, oh, you know, I'll just go see the doctor. He'll give me some pills that'll take care of it. Um, you know, we don't think about food in terms of nutrition and nourishment necessarily. We think of it in terms of convenience and hunger. And, um, I mean, gosh, you just take a drive down the street and you see so many fast food signs and, 
and uh, you know, quick in and out restaurants, and restaurants are expected to get you a, a meal on your table in in under twenty minutes. And when you're uh, waiting in line to buy your apples at the grocery store, they get you with the candy on the at, at the yeah. checkout. It's everywhere. It's totally everywhere. And I think that you know, it's so different ten years ago than it is right now. But we didn't make a change until we were in that kind of situation. However we didn't know any of this information beforehand. Nobody had said to us, like, as personal trainers, as as people who, you know, wanted to look good, wanted to live healthy lives, nobody had ever passed this information to us. And I think that a lot of information today is being passed around um, a lot more than it was 10 years ago. But for a lot of people like you and like us, we didn't, we didn't, find out that information until we had to. It wasn't as readily available. The internet was just getting started 10 years ago and really booming and all these people. Now there's communities everywhere on Facebook, on on Instagram. You can meet people like the PBNSG. You know, like there's so many communities and and possibilities now that there weren't 10 years ago. So were you the Well, and I don't know... Sorry, I don't know that the research was there 10 years ago either. I mean, you think Forks Over Knives came out in 2011. Right. And, um, you know, I don't, I mean, you didn't really, if you start looking at the at the research on nutrition and diet and plant-based diets, it's really only been in the last 10 years. What did you find first? Do you remember what you found first? Because uh, we were like, right, like, like, Sages, Sage just turned nine. So th- this started for us 10 years ago. Yeah, I found the China study and that had just come out when I started. And then I found Forks Dr. Esselstyn. Forks new, Over new. Knives in 2011 yeah. just came out and I saw it like just when it came out. So yeah, it was all around that time too. Were you the type of person who would have said before, you know, like let's say a year before your journey started, would you have said, oh, I'm a carnivore, I can never give up meat. I know once you gave it up and decided to, that was a non-issue for you, but before you knew this information. Um, You know, I had dabbled in vegetarianism like 10 years ago and didn't mind it. Um, But, you know, sure, I was was the guy that grilled steaks for the family every weekend, you know. (laughs) And uh, you want to talk about grilling some, some meat. I mean, we... We had a pretty booming business. We did a lot of catering. We had a couple of food trucks. Um, and you're just talking about thousands of pounds of beef and pork and chicken and salmon that we smoked every single week. Unbelievable amounts. And unbelievable amounts that people ate just blew my mind. Um, so I would say that if five years ago you said, you know, you, you need to be vegetarian or vegan, I probably would have looked at you and said, yeah, what for? You know, right. that's silly, you know. But um, I don't know. So that, I guess that's that's my two cents there. <laughs> I'm not sure. And so when you made all these changes, did that get changed in the chef department as well? Did you stop doing the barbecue? What happened in that, in your professional career that way? <laughs> Okay, so um, you know, for because I was really pretty ill for a couple of months there, um, I wasn't in the in at the business every single day, but you know, still taking care of the books and taking care of the taxes and and booking events and working with uh, with catering contracts and things like that, um, but just not day to day operations. And I was trying to make some changes there, but my partner was like, not going to have it. I'm like, you know, we're kind of probably making people sick with this. And the hottest food trend going right now is, is vegan food. We should probably think about making changes. And my partner's like, ah, no, no way, not changing anything, you know? And, and we had seen a lot of people request vegan options from a barbecue place. And I was kind of thinking, huh, what in the world? Um, so I was seeing some of that, but um, I, I, I guess I saw the writing on the wall that that, that, that partnership probably was not going to work out. So first of the year, 2017, I asked if they wanted to you know, take it over completely, and uh, they agreed that they would do that and, and uh, as well as take on any liability. So I walked away pretty much with nothing, but you know, not with, with any debt or anything like that, so it's kind of kind of nice, a pretty clean break for me. Um, so 
uh, January 2017, I was I was washed my hands of it. And so, where did that bring you now? So, what are you actually doing now? Okay, so um, I do a number of different things. I'm I've I am a research junkie, and that's probably you know why I did okay finding my own way into the plant based world without somebody telling me that oh you got to go vegan, man. <laughs> um, so. With that, I, I guess I consider myself a bit of a nutrition nerd. I don't know if you've seen any of the articles that I've written and that type of thing on colorectal cancer and type 2 diabetes and uh, things like that. Uh, so a lot of what I do now has to do with uh, uh, writing nutrition-based uh, articles. Um, you can find a lot of those on my blog at arespectfullife.com. Um, some other places that I publish as well, but... Uh, so that, and I do some coaching, but the really weird thing about getting away from the restaurant is, um, the community that I'm in is fairly small. There's about, um, 9,000 residents in the, in the city proper. It's, it's more in the surrounding area and I'm basically a suburb of, of Detroit. Um, but the community itself is pretty small and having a business in the downtown district of the, of the suburb, I knew a lot of people and I was so connected to the community and the chamber of commerce was next door and the main street group was on the other side of us and the i catered for the mayor constantly and knew the city council and that that type of thing so i found that um being away from it i felt really disconnected from the from the community and that was just really odd for me so uh an opportunity came up for me to uh do some cooking demos at the local farmer's market and so I started doing that. And so what I would do is um, find out what produce was in season, uh, what, you know, what the vendors were going to be bringing to the market, and then create uh, plant-based oil-free recipes uh, surrounding that. And I talked to people about plant-based nutrition and optimal health and how to cook without oil and things like that. So, uh, so it gave me an opportunity to be connected back with the community, but also use my cooking skills to, you know, demonstrate to other people how easy it is to cook healthy food. And what kind of outcomes have you seen? What kind of feedback have you been getting from people? Um, you know, I, I've had a few people that have decided to embark on a plant-based journey, but there are several even of my customers now that are trying to eat a whole lot healthier and to limit their meat consumption and to increase their their plant proteins and their plant consumption. So um, it's been it's been pretty impactful, I think, on the community. The radio station uh, had me on. The um, the local news, you know, did a did a big article on it and that type of thing. So um, you know, it's it's been it's been fun. I I've enjoyed it and I've enjoyed you know I enjoyed reconnecting with a lot of my customers and. Uh, funny thing is a lot of them didn't recognize me because here was this great big 350 pound guy and now I'm under 200 pounds and they're looking at me going, you look familiar, but you know, and then they'd hear my voice and go, Oh, Jeff. Yeah. It's half a Jeff. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. So yeah, it's been fun. And you talked about being in the gyms and biking. So is that something that you do outside the gym as well, or are you a gym rat? What, what do you have going on in terms no, of fitness? So as far as the, the gym is concerned, um, I, I have my share of mus muscular skeletal issues. Um, so I'm pretty careful. I stay away from free weights personally. I use mostly nautil Nautilus machines. So I do um, a bit of you know all body resistance training. And, uh, and then as far as bicycle, bike, bicycling is concerned, I have a, you know, 21 speed mountain bike with road tires on it. So, um, you know, I'm just all over the area here. I, I'm in a pretty neat area. There's a lot of gravel back roads and things like that, that are real hilly. So it gets to be a challenge. And, uh, then I have several friends that are parts of bike clubs and we have a, 35 mile what they call it border to border trail that's from one city to another so i'll do that or or bike out to belle isle and outside of detroit and that type of thing so the exercise only came in a little bit later after you started losing the weight right right yeah it, it was over a year later that i started you know really going to the gym um oh, but it, it, i think it's difficult when you're that heavy to 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 
feel motivated to, you know, get on a treadmill and things like that. And the people that just say, I'm going to do this and they don't understand the diet portion of it. And they just decide they're going to get on the treadmill and go and go and go every day. It's, it can be really hard on the, on the joints, uh, especially with, when you're talking over a hundred pounds of excess weight. So, right. And so you lost some of the weight It gave you the energy and the drive and the motivation to start going to the gym and doing some exercise. And now you fill that energy with good exercise to make your body feel good. And, but the foundation was really the nutrition and nutrition first. Yeah. yeah, A lot of people think that you got to do the exercise to lose the weight and they forget that the weight actually gets lost with what you put into your mouth from the kitchen. And that's a very important piece that I think a lot of people miss out on. Yeah. I always say you can't outrun a bad bad diet, right? Absolutely. I see a lot of people trying to kill themselves in the, in the gym and I'm like, man, you gotta, you gotta beat the fork before you beat on your body. You gotta put that (laughs) energy onto the chopping board first, right? Exactly. So talk about the chopping board. I know that, I only learned how to cut peppers, I'm going to use air quotes and say properly, uh, about two <laughs> years ago, a friend of mine had taken, um, she had gone to chef school and I was watching her prepare a stir fry or whatever it is that she was making us for dinner. And I was like, so that's how they get the peppers to, you know, all be the same size. So being a chef and being plant based, what kind of tips or tricks can you give us? Like, what do you know that people are always cutting things wrong or we can get more out of the vegetables or fruits that we're cutting what kind of tips can you give us without doing a demo um don't be afraid of it (laughs) first of all um you know in my opinion unless you're really trying to get fancy there's no there's no wrong way to to cut a vegetable um you know there there are certain tricks that that'll make things go more quickly um, for example, uh, an onion, you know, take an onion, you cut the ends off, you cut it in half. So the flat side is down so it doesn't slip and you cut your fingers and you, and you cut slits into it one way and then you go the other way and dice it. And it's kind of like the flower method, they call that. So when you cut the onion, are you cutting it in half from where the little ends are or are you cutting it across yes. from end to end? Yeah, I'm cutting it in half from from the ends and putting it down so the flat part is on the cutting board so it's not slipping around on you. Just, you know, that way you avoid Do it different every time. <laughs> cutting your finger. You know, well, a lot of people try and cut them on the round and if you've ever slipped and put a finger into your little little or put a knife into your little finger, um, that's not very fun. I mean, that'll make you cry especially with onion juice in it. And mm-hmm. I've done that. <laughs> So years and years ago, I think I was about 26 years old, I did that in a restaurant, trying to cut it in in rings. And yeah, don't bother with that. So I like what you said that there's no right or wrong way to actually do it. And it's going to just save time if you do it differently. But I think that's one of the challenges that people have in the kitchen. They think that, oh, I got to eat plant based and it's going to take me so time, so much time to now prepare my food. And there's so many tricks and ways to do things a little bit faster. Uh, so that's... Diced frozen onions, <laughs> to diced tomatoes, right. to, uh, cut, cut green beans. And like that's how I'll make a soup when I'm really in a rush. Yeah. <laughs> but it's not well, as economical to buy everything diced. No, that's for sure. Um, but the, the joy of a food processor too. I mean, you can get some of that stuff done very quickly in a food processor. And one of the things that I've tried to, to do is... Um, you know, for my blog and for other people, I try to develop recipes that are really pretty easy for most people to do. And I call them one pan or one pot recipes. So you can literally throw all the stuff in there and let it cook for 20 or 30 minutes and it's done. Um, so, you know, a lot of those things, when you're talking about doing chilies, soups, stews, um, things like that, you can use a food processor and just pulse it and chop the stuff up really quick and throw it in there. I mean, it's just not not a big deal. I mean, you're talking about trying to get a nutrient dense meal uh, that's also going to be satiating and flavorful. So, you know, throwing throwing the green pepper, just some, just chunk it up and chunk up the onion and throw it in the food processor and pulse it a few times and you can throw it in your dish and it's not really a big deal. I find sometimes it makes it a little watery and can that ruin my dish? I don't think so. No. I mean, if you think about it, it's uh, 
those that's all flavor that's that's in those liquids those are those are um waters and oils and things that are part of the plant and it and it certainly flavors it so no it's it you know especially like if you're talking about a chili you know no use hand hand dicing onion to throw in a chili so you mentioned earlier that you do your cooking without oil and that's shocking a lot of people that are probably listening because they're thinking, well, I know not us. Well, no, a lot of and, our listeners well, yeah, are oil free. But there are some that still use oil to start their stir fries or to prepare their soups or their stews. How do people get away from the oil and what do they do in replacement of that? So kind of a funny thing because I... You know, when I was introduced to PBNSG, uh, which would have been uh, a year and a half ago, a little, little more than that, um, they were talking about no oil. And I was like dumbfounded because I, I thought, how in the world do you cook without oil? I've been cooking in a restaurant most of my adult life, right? And you always use oil. You use oil in everything. And that's that's why it's hard to eat out if you're, if you're oil-free. Um, so... The the thing that I tell people, the, the two best hints, especially for sautéing, is to use a good quality, nonstick, hard anized pan that's not Teflon because Teflon will flake off of there. But use the, the hardened pan and like Scan Pan is the brand that I prefer. And you just got to turn the heat down a little bit. You're not you know cranking it like you would just to quickly sauté things. You're turning it down to medium or less. And just put a couple tablespoons of vegetable broth or, or low sodium tamari or water or whatever in there, and you can just simmer it that way, and it works just fine. You can caramelize onions that way. You can do that in a ceramic pan, or you can do it in the you know. So it does take a, a little bit better quality pan, typically not for everything, but the the thought that we have to saute everything in oil is kind of ridiculous we just don't have to do it you know you get the same flavors out of the out of the uh, vegetables if you do it with a little bit of water and if it sticks a little bit to the to the bottom of the pan you can throw a couple of sprinkles of uh, either water or vinegar or white wine or whatever you'd like to to cook with to deglaze the pan to basically take those little um, you know darkened particles off the bottom of the pan there's a lot of flavor in that and that's a, actually a cooking technique that that uh, they use in in a lot of fine dining as well. I like that. What about getting the most out of the garlic? Does does it really help if you smash the top of the garlic with the flat of the knife and then chop it up? Um, one word, maybe it's two words: garlic press. God, I mm. love the garlic press. I hate <laughs> cleaning it out after, but I love yeah. using it. Yeah. Yeah, if you if you uh, if you take your the tip of your knife and get it right away before it gets all sticky and hardened on there, that's the best way to do it. But um, yeah, so I, I'm a garlic press fan. I there are not too many dishes that I don't use a garlic press with. Uh, so that's you know that in my opinion that's there's that's the only way to do it. And if you're really that lazy and you really don't want to, you can buy minced garlic and water. You know, a lot of it comes in oil, but I think the frozen ones will come will come in. Um, they do have in them water. in water. Yeah, yeah. It, it's I find in the I find in the States, there's more options in terms of frozen things like that that are actually oil free, especially if you have it um, Whole Foods or something near you. OK, getting back to the um, garlic. So there's garlic shoots. Right. But then <laughs> if you let your garlic go for too long inside each bulb a garlic shoot starts to grow. So is that really bitter and do you need to cut that out? Um, I say no. Um, yeah. I don't think it's necessary. I mean, it, it is a little bit bitier, but I wouldn't call it bitter. It's it's kind of like eating chives. Mm. Very similar or or the top of a green onion. Oh, but not the one that grows out of the middle of it. Like each, each right. little, oh, clove, not bulb. Each little clove, if you let it go too long, then you start to get a shoot in each little clove growing right. in the bulb. What about that? Well, I don't, well, I don't, you don't let it go I don't that long. long. Anyone could, could let it go that long. <laughs> Maybe you're buying too much garlic or not using it often enough. Oh, there if we go. go away and then come back. Well, we got to use more of it. <laughs> yeah. There you go. Amazing. Uh, so, so no, I don't think that that, that part is bitter and has to be cut off. I think that that's a misnomer, you know? 
Yeah, Good. some great trips, some great trips, some great <laughs> tricks and tips. Thanks so much for sharing those in the kitchen. That's amazing. And you thank you so much for sharing your, your story and your background and inspiring people and influencing them in your community to think plant-based, go plant-based, take out the oil, uh, doing those demos at the farmer's market. That's all awesome. Continue to do that great stuff. Thank you for sharing you. with us. If people want to reach out and connect with you, where would be the best place for them to go? Um, well, I guess that depends on your social media channel, but I use the moniker Respectful Living, so I can be found on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, um, or at arespectfullife.com, and all of the social media is linked that way. So I put a lot of articles, I put a lot of recipes out there, um, you know, some thought provoke provoke provoking um articles as well like uh, about pathogens and uh, parasites found in in animal products and you know just to get people thinking that you know maybe we're not really meant to eat that kind of stuff certainly not in the quantities they do today so absolutely and we're going to link to all of those that you just mentioned on uh, in our show notes at planttrainers.com so that anybody listening can find it there as well thank you so much for your time today i know we appreciate it i know our listeners have probably learned a lot and have been extremely inspired i can't wait to share all these tips with everybody about the kitchen because um uh, my big thing is that i'm not a chef i i make recipes i post recipes i help people but not a chef in any way. I just do it the easiest way that's in feels right to me. So it's nice to get some some insight from you as well. Yep, you bet. You're welcome.